My name is Julia Hardy. Uh, I am the host of The Gaming Show, which is a Radio 1 visual radio show, which is their way of saying a TV show, but for Radio 1 on iPlayer. Um, it's best job in the world. Um, it was a bit of a weird route to getting to host that show, uh, as is most things. If you ever ask a presenter how they've become a presenter, it's always quite convoluted. So this is my really convoluted story. So uh, it starts with this man. <laughs> uh, includes uh, PlayStation also as well, and a doctor's surgery. So this is how convoluted it will become. Stick with me. Right. So, uh, the reason why this man is involved, uh, his name is DJ Barbecue, a.k.a. Christian Stevenson. Back in the day, he used to host a TV show on Channel 5 called Rad, which was like a skater show, and there was had some like, really cool music. Anyway, I met him in a pub and had a conversation with him. Uh, I can't even remember what about. Off the back of that, he said, oh, Julia, you know, I bet you'd be a really good presenter. You should do that. And I'd never really thought of it as a job, because how would you even begin to go about becoming a presenter? That didn't really make any sense. Um, he actually ended up putting me in touch with the team behind the show. They were like looking for a female presenter. As it actually panned out, uh, they ended up not going in that direction. But I think that kind of first sort of planted the seed that maybe that was something that I could do. Anyway, so skip forward a little way, PlayStation. So uh, PlayStation held a competition many, many years ago, called uh, PlayStation's Summer of Freedom. And it basically involved, uh, they wanted to find people who were going to spend a summer of freedom and go around vlogging. Uh, they, I auditioned for this. Uh, actually, at the time, I didn't even know what a vlog was. They were like, in this audition, I remember this distinctly, in this audition, they're like, oh, if you were going to like vlog this thing now, like, what would you do? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I just was like, oh, well, I just, you know, do this or I'd like jump over this, you know, wall or something. I just, I guessed. I, it's actually quite awkward bringing that up now. Um, and uh, I got picked uh, and there was like four of us basically who spent this uh, whole uh, summer of freedom basically going around to different events and vlogging about it. So I was messing around vlogging about it. Uh, I come from like a sort of small little village that's kind of been swallowed up by Greater London. And most of my friends, we just used to mess around in car parks because there wasn't really anything else to do. Uh, so I've got those kind of friends, if you know what I mean. Uh, so some of the vlogs that I did were just us messing around. I dressed up as Batman a lot, I think, and just like trolled people in my little hometown doing weird stuff anyway. One of the vlogs that I did, um, I don't know how we got around to this, uh, was uh, a fake MTV show. I'm going to show you this clip in a minute. It's really embarrassing, please. Oh, so cringe. I really want to hide behind something. Anyway, um, it was a fake MTV show that we made up that was called Behind the Camera, and I was going to interview the guy who did the special effects for the Fantastic Four, which is actually just my friend Paul, um, with some cotton wool stuck to his face. Um, do, I, do I just go forward and it plays? Yeah, okay. I'm going to have to stop this because it gets really, really cringe, really. It's already cringe. Hello and welcome to Behind the Camera. Today we're in a rainy Swindon uh, so where we're about to meet the master scientist behind the special effects of the Fantastic Four. Now, um, you may be wondering why we're standing outside what apparently appears to be a shed, but this is no ordinary shed. This is the workshop of Smithka Lucenze, who's the pioneer of real-time special effects in Hollywood. Um, not quite sure why he's in Swindon, but uh, maybe we can answer some of those questions in a moment. Um, today he's ever. agreed to give us a little sneaky peeky into uh, the special effects behind each one of the Fantastic Four. So why don't we come on inside and uh, go and meet Smithka. I really come feel on. like you should see Paul's face before I stop this. Hi, hi, it's, it's, it's Julia from uh, behind the camera. I hope you weren't expecting us. Okay, I think that's quite enough of that. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we were just like kind of messing around uh, and, and doing that. Uh, and then funny story, Paul, who uh, was the guy with the cotton wool all over his face, uh, ended up going to the doctor's surgery one day in Pinner uh, because he was sick. Well, it'd be weird if you went there if you were healthy and just hung out, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> Um, and he met a gentleman who was involved in setting up a new Sky TV channel and he was wearing a band t-shirt, they just randomly got chatting. They were looking for female presenters. Uh, this guy, he gave this guy my, like, my number, I met up with him in a local pub, didn't really say anything. Like, honestly, I turned up with like, I never used to wear makeup or anything, turned up with like a jumper that I'd like bitten the holes. You know, like when you bite the sleep, yeah, it was like literally zero reference to how anyone was looking at me from the outside anyway. Met this guy, went to this audition, um, was kind of 
I figured they'd probably just stick a camera in front of me and ask me to talk about something. So I stole loads of Mark Commode's thoughts and ideas about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and just regurgitated them as my own. They didn't know that. It's fine. Um, and they got the job at Rockwell TV. And Rockwell TV was basically us. Uh, well, they, they'd film live shows and then we'd do interviews with bands and they'd package them up and put them on the TV channel. And one of the things they wanted to do was a kind of news and review show like talking about bands and stuff that was going on. I was really into film and cinema and video games, so I was like, well, can we incorporate these things? And as it was this sort of weird Sky Channel, they were like, yeah, obviously we're not going to pay you extra for it, but, you know, go right ahead. Um, and this was how Rockjaw was born. This is the best quality version of this image that I could find anywhere, let me tell you. Um, when TV used to be four by three. Oh, the days. Um, so it's basically just us kind of messing around, reviewing games. It was like it felt very much like a kind of weird cable access show. So that was kind of my first um, conversations that I started having uh, with the games industry and kind of starting to review stuff. Obviously, at that time, there was like zero TV, so they were all quite keen, even though it was on in the middle of the night and no one watched it. Um, and then after that kind of happened, that kind of uh, show sort of went off. Um, I ended up going freelance, and I just answered an advert, actually, in like a weird website for someone to host like a video game TV show. Uh, went to that audition, talked nonsense for a while, got the job. That was Game Face, which was the greeniest green screen show you've ever seen. Uh, it had five backgrounds that just repeated over and over again. And the only way you could tell the difference between what show it was was by my outfit. Um, I still don't really understand why there was one that had oranges in it, and no one has been able to explain that to me, but I think I'll never know, it's a bit late. Um, so that was Game Face, that went on Bravo for about a year and a half. Bravo then actually stopped here in the UK, and then I jumped over to Challenge TV, where I did a show called The Blurb, which was kind of a more magazine style, uh, you know, getting like, uh, people who work in the games industry, bands, usually involving some stupid challenges or a bucking bronco. So it's like my perfect TV show. And then did that for a year and a half. Then, um, oh wait, hold on. Then I basically, um, I wanted to kind of go uh, freelance. And I, I really love doing specialist stuff. But I think that people who are like mega into games will always be into games. But I found, you know, making a show where you're kind of pitching games to people who are a bit like, Meh, you know, like sort of sitting on the fence a bit was quite fun. I like convincing someone who maybe only buys FIFA to go and buy a different type of video game. And also, it kind of just really, I mean, it just really sort of annoyed me that video games were always looked at like this kind of like weird, creepy cousin of the entertainment industry. You know, like, mm, it's just gamers over there and always like put on the weird table at the wedding with all the other people no one wants to talk to. When actually we should be revered and respected because what we're doing is the forefront of entertainment. We're on the cutting edge. And actually, if anything, they should give us like a scepter and a crown because we're the best. So um, I decided to kind of change tack a bit and go even more mainstream. I mean, theoretically, if you want to do presenting, I, it, was, it was at a point now where there's lots more video content and you could go to IGN or GameSpot and you could be a games presenter and have a very stable job, a nice salary, uh, office that maybe provides you with snacks, that kind of thing. But this sort of felt more like something I wanted to do, kind of my calling to sort of, you know, maybe try and change people's minds about stuff. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so that led to... Uh, well, I think one of the best jobs in video games today, certainly if you're a presenter, which is working with Radio 1 and making the gaming show. So we've been doing this for about two years now. It's a monthly show. Um, we've been to a whole load of different places. It's, um, so I'll go on the radio uh, once a week and kind of pick a game of the week, but also then I'll do this on iPlayer as well. So some of the things we've done, we did one about Ready Player One, which was great, because obviously we got to kind of interview people from the movie. Um, Lara Croft, The Legacy, so looking back at the huge history of Lara Croft, we met some of the original PR firms who got Lara on the front cover of The Face. Fascinating. Talk to Ian Livingston, who told us that when Lara Croft... Sorry, I'm going off a total tangent. It's just interesting. Uh, when, she was, um, when she was promoting LucasAid, their uh, sales went up by 40%. That's a great fact, sorry, had to share. Um, we did a Gaming for All diversity one. Uh, we actually went out to Korea to hang out with Brendan Green and talk about PUBG. And next week, because the next show's about Fortnite, they thought it'd be really funny for me to do my opening link while being thrown out of a plane. <sighs> Didn't really check with me, but fine, I'll figure it out. I might actually have to write it on my hand. I'm terrified of heights, so it should be interesting. Um, so one of the things Simon uh, asked, uh, asked us to do was to kind of talk a little bit about what my day-to-day -day is like. 
And it's an impossible question to answer because actually being freelance and doing what I do and having a Radio 1 contract and I'll like do other stuff. So like I've hosted like Minecon, I'll do Xbox Daily Show for me, three things like that. Um, it's completely different every day, every week. And it will be kind of peaks and troughs, I suppose, like all freelance life where you'll have a really stressful couple of weeks, which is what's happening at the moment. And then you'll have another couple of weeks where it's like really chilled out and you're like, why don't I have a normal job? I've just been sitting in my pants. But then also because it's video games, you're allowed a certain amount of sitting in your pants as long as you're playing games, so it's fine. Um, so yeah, anything, you know, uh, I could be brought in to help someone uh, come up with an idea for a show or Sometimes you just kind of helicopter in and people just give you a script and that's what you do. It's, um, it's really, really different uh, all the time, but I kind of like that. I, I feel like uh, very much the sort of perception of gaming is changing slowly and certainly within kind of more mainstream media. I have lots of conversations with production companies and channels who are desperate to do more things with games but they're never quite sure quite how to do it. Or that my favorite question that I get asked is like, oh yeah, hi, we're such and such channel. We want to do some esports, And I'm like... Why? Why do you want to do that? Like, I mean, I don't mean you shouldn't do esports. I just mean, but why do you want to do that? It's like saying, hello, I'd like to do a sport. What sport? Why? And for what reason? And for who? You know, it's not this sort of, yeah. Anyway, so like part of what I end up doing is I feel like I'm moderately educating people as I go around. Half of these meetings are just me explaining the different esports and why maybe League of Legends shouldn't go on certain channels because it wouldn't work. Anyway, um, so it's completely different. But I kind of quite like it, and I like kind of flying the flag a little bit. Um, so there is a certain element. So the pluses and minuses of taking like a career <laughs> presenter job, like obviously you know you do get the uh, the regularity of payment and the stability. And if you only ever wanted to talk about video games, you know, going and working for those companies probably makes the most sense. Um, but because I kind of want to take a slightly different path, it is amazing, but it is also a little bit soul-crushing at times because you don't have that kind of stability and stuff around you. But I think as long as you... I, th I suppose it's about kind of knowing your worth and, like, training up and getting good at what you do and understanding, like, I always felt, like, deep in my heart that gaming is only going to, you know, expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and I believe that solely, and I believe that there will be more jobs out there. I think, you know, what I'm doing is kind of only the start of it. And once kind of more mainstream channels and stuff start picking up and doing more gaming shows, I think there's just going to be an explosion. So, you know, it only takes like one big show to kind of start that tipping point. So, yeah. And um, so I suppose one of the things about presenting is that most people don't like talking on camera because it feels really weird and you feel like an idiot. And then you look in the camera and you're like, oh, everyone's going to watch this and think I'm a complete idiot. That's completely normal. Like with most things that are a little bit terrifying, you basically just have to do it until you're slightly bored and then you can kind of concentrate on getting better at it. Everybody is terrible when you first start. No one is great at presenting. It's impossible. Although it just looks like you're standing up and talking, there are sort of little tips and techniques and stuff you can learn. But that's just through doing. And to show you... <laughs> And to show you how you suck terribly at the start, I thought I would show you my first ever piece to camera, which is actually kind of oddly a little bit similar to that one outside of a shed. I think I even used some of the same words. I'm actually just going to have like a mild anxiety attack right now by showing you this. Um, it's awful. So you'll start off something like this, which is terrible. It's awful. I don't know where I got this presenting style from. Also, my voice sounds completely different now. It's really weird. And uh, if you notice, I've got two things in my hands which are lighters because I couldn't stop doing the link without clapping. It's fine. It will get better and it will never be as bad as this. <laughs> Hello and welcome. We're here in Dusseldorf, Germany to witness the sonic assault that is the Machine and Fest. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Machine and Fest is, it's a three-day festival showcasing the very best in experimental industrial and noise artists from around the world. Still a little bit unclear as to what that's all about? Well, we're going to take you inside and show you a little sneaky peeky into what this is all about. So come on in. Can I also just say, making some, like, there is a thing in presenting, sorry, there's a thing in presenting called walking and talking, and some presenters can walk and talk, and actually it can be quite difficult. They made me walk backwards. That was the first ever thing I ever did. I was walking backwards and having to do this thing. Anyway, it will never be as bad as that. So if it's something you want to do, just talk from the heart, just be passionate, and that's how you'll engage an audience. You haven't got to be brilliant and amazing from the start, but as long as you talk from the heart, everyone's always going to be on your side, and it's a really, really fun career. So, thank you. What's the 
best studio you've ever been to, to to interview someone or to meet someone? What's the coolest place you've been? I don't know, because like you tend to meet like quote unquote the coolest people more at events. Um, but I have to say, actually, like going to um, going to Korea to like interview Brenda Green was really really fun because they just moved into their new office and everyone was going around on segways. It's really fun, although there's lots of people falling over. I don't know, you, you get to meet people. Um, the thing I love most about presenting is the fact that you get to meet people from all different walks of life who've had really, really interesting careers, have done something amazing, and you get to ask the questions. You can ask what you want because at the end of the day, no one can like tell you what to ask, so it's quite fun. And you get to find out how people did things or most of the time someone went through something quite difficult to get where they're getting or there's a sacrifice they made or there's something that they've learned. And that's great. You get basically all the best knowledge in the world because you go around all these different places. It's really good fun, yeah. Um, and outside of the parachute, that leads dynamics. Why, I just don't have brought that up. What's the scariest thing outside of that? Scariest? Well, what's the most interesting perspective, I guess, for people? Uh, okay, I think, okay, scariest is slightly more left field in that I did a TED talk once about sexism and misogyny and how it affects us all in front of 1,300 people uh, the day after the EU referendum. Which was because I was trying to learn it the night before, and like I was watching the news, and I was like, and then I got up the next day, and I was like, "Are you all right?" And I'm like, "Well, I had a prime minister, and I was part of Europe. Maybe I should change my talk." Um, so that was uh, one of the most rewarding things. But TED talks are ultimately really terrifying because you don't have a script, an auto cue, or anything to help you, and it's just 15 minutes, and there's this really big clock that stares at you. And plus, also because it was about sexism and misogyny, I was like. If I get this wrong, my life online from now until the day I die is going to be intolerable. So there's a little bit of that in your head. Um, but yeah, that, that was pretty terrifying. Um, I think just the more you do stuff, live can, can be a bit of a tricky thing to learn. Because there's that panic of, what if I do something wrong? That's it. Uh, but that, again, that just comes from, it comes from practice and just kind of taking a breath and knowing you know what you are talking about and just, yeah, just relax, I think is the key thing. Breathing techniques actually really help if you're nervous. Um, one of the best things you can do, like, you know, if you're about to stand up and do something and you can feel like your heart in your chest and don't get me wrong, I've done some jobs where it feels a bit like that. There's a really, really good breathing technique and this sounds a bit boring, but it really, really works uh, where you breathe in for four and then you hold it for one and then you breathe out for eight and then you hold it for one and you just repeat that. And it sounds really silly and you do it and you're like, this isn't working. And then about 15, 20 seconds later, like you just chill out. And then as soon as you're kind of a bit more relaxed, you slow down how you speak, although me, never. Um, <laughs> and um, you can kind of just relax into it. But it really, really helps with nerves. So just practice. Are you finished now? Press trip. <laughs> Best press trip. Um, so for the BBC, we don't go on press trips. We're not allowed to. Everything, because it's obviously publicly funded and it's... Uh, we shouldn't be taking freebies, basically. So all of the trips that we've gone on for the gaming show have all been funded by the BBC. Um, I'm trying to think of ones that we've been on before. Um, like some great E3 ones. I don't know, it's all a bit of a blur, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, yeah, no, I can't remember a single thing. That would be, yeah. It's gonna say free poor yeah. in America. It's very cloudy. <laughs>